Hey guys, so today's video is going to be a little bit different. Last night, randomly, Lance Egan messaged me saying uh, they're having a Fly Fish Team USA mini qualifier out on Six Lakes and someone dropped out and they needed someone to fill in. So that person is going to be me today. So we're fishing a fly comp today, competition rules, all that stuff. Uh, it's all still water. I have no expectations of myself. There's a lot of good fishermen here, so hopefully we'll just catch some fish and have some fun. Anyways, no, nothing about the lakes, just gonna fish. Anyways, I get to film, trusty cam, so uh, look forward to that. Anyways, it should be fun. Let's get at it. This event was the Six Lakes Mini, which is a Western Region Fly Fishing Team USA mini qualifier. It was held on two still waters in central Utah. The event had 12 anglers broken down into two groups of six. Each group fishes a lake for three hours across three different beats and then switches with the other group for the afternoon for another three hours. My group consisted of Glade, Jackie, Phil, Mike, and Chris. The two still waters we're fishing are Eagle Lake and Meadow Lake at Six Lakes Resort outside Altamont, Utah. Still waters are still kind of a work in progress for me. I've definitely put in a lot of time in the last year to get a little bit better at them. But I still feel like moving waters are my strength. That coupled with the fact that I got invited 12 hours before the event, didn't really have time to tie and fill out my still water boxes. You know, I didn't have a ton of expectations for this event. I was hoping, you know, not to get last. But really, I was in it for the experience and to fish my first fly fishing competition and see how I held up. So my goal was just to go out there, catch some fish, do as well as I could. So let's jump in here and go over some of the gear I brought to the competition. The first rod I brought was an... Echo Stillwater, 10 foot 5 weight. I primarily threw a midge tip on this rod. You know, it's a great rod for throwing sinking lines on stillwaters, and I was really glad to have this rod out. It helped me keep the fly line up over the tall grass and bushes that line the banks, and let me throw longer casts when I needed to. So this rod was definitely right up its alley for what it should be doing, and I was glad to have it. The second rod I choose to bring was the Streamer X, Echo Streamer X. This is a 9 foot 7 weight. This is a Kelly Gallup Streamer Rod. While it is a 9 foot rod, it really does just throw line really well. And if I was going to be throwing any streamers on sinking lines at the competition, I wanted to have this rod with me. I opted to bring it over my... 10 foot 7 weight Reddington Predator, mostly because I just like casting this rod better. So the third rod I decided to have with me at the competition was a 9 foot 5 weight Hardy Ultralight. You know, this rod isn't the best rod at casting inside 45 feet, if I'm being honest. Even with the MPX or Infinity line, it's just, it doesn't load that well and doesn't have a ton of accuracy and feel and close. I don't really want to overline it either. But what this rod really excels at is throwing dry flies at long distances. So from the bank, we were making long casts and I was really glad to have this rod, especially with the long dropper uh, section off of it. It could still turn the rig over great and really shoot line into the wind or at distance. That's what where this rod really excels. So I was also happy with my dry fly rod choice. For lines, I have my SA Amplitude MPX Textured Line. This is a floating line for throwing dry flies. I was kind of torn between bringing this line and my uh, Amplitude Infinity Textured Line. I feel like the Infinity would carry the Hopper Dropper Rig better at distance, but that line lives on my Hardy Ultra Disc, and the MPX lives on my Hydros for now. So I decided to go with the MPX because it can still do a decent job at carrying that rig and it would allow me more flexibility for changing out lines. For a Mitch tip, I have the 
Rio Premier Midge Tip. This is a three foot tip with an uh, intermediate section. This line pulled a lot of heavy duty for throwing balance leeches and chironomids during the competition. I fish this line a lot. I love it. If I needed to get deeper, in my backpack I had a couple of spare spools. I brought the Type 5 Seamless Density SA Sonar line. The Stillwater line and the line sinks at a rate that will allow it to main straight as you're pulling stuff in. But I didn't have end up throwing the Type 5. I also have a hover line, which is a 1 IPS line. It just gets under the surface film and is great for keeping streamers or other things suspended in the first 1 to 3 feet of the water column. So if they were up near the surface, hover line's a great option. I didn't end up using that line either. I didn't change out any of the spools I originally put on. For my Type 7s, I've got an Airflow Streamer Max Long Kelly Gallops line. You know, it's a great still water line because it, it's a type 8, so it gets down, but it also has an intermediate running line. So it doesn't have as much of a hinge when fishing still water when you're getting down deep. I didn't throw the type 8 in the competition, but uh, this is a great line both for still water and moving waters. You know, for a streamer line, it's tough to beat. I also brought my uh, floating line for the 7 weight. That's a. Uh, SA Titan line, just a floating and uh, seven weight. And the seven weight line I originally put on the reel and fished through the competition was a type three sink tip. It's, a, it's okay for still water. You'd probably want a seamless density in type three, but uh, it's a great moving water line too for fishing sinking tips on the rivers. It would just allow me to get to the depths I was looking for and do an okay job at it, so I put that line on originally and that's what I fished in the competition. You know, I'm happy with how my gear performed. I was glad with the choices I made and the lines I put on, but this is what I brought to the competition. So the first lake I was going to be fishing was Eagle Lake. Specifically, I was starting on beat four of Eagle Lake. When I kind of walked the beats, I noticed that there were kind of uh, shallow weed beds up close with some deeper water behind them. But when I kind of looked to see what was swimming around up shallow, I only saw small bass. I didn't see any trout and I didn't see very many trout surfacing out in the middle. So I figured with Slick calm water and the bluebird skies we seem to have. It's probably going to be better to start out deeper. So I've got my midge tip here and I've got a comp legal balanced coronamid. It's balanced with the inverting tungsten bead. And I've got my TF coronamid. They're spaced about four, four and a half feet apart. So what I really wanted to do in the first 10 minutes was to see if I could find a cadence, a depth, and get a good idea for how easy or tough the fishing was going to be based on catch rates among myself and the competitors. Here I'm starting out deep and starting slow because my gut feeling was that the fish were going to be deep and not chasing. You can see I let my flies get down towards the bottom and I'm making really slow pulls as I bring them in. I do want to change up my cadence to find out how aggressive they're going to be or how willing to eat they're going to be. Just trying to get a feel for how far I can cast here. So here I'm just letting the flies get deep. I'm watching the coils and the lines to see if they'll take it on the drop. At this point, it's been two or three minutes and nobody's caught a fish yet. Well, 
great fishing would have been a blast and if everyone was just you know getting 10 15 fish an hour it would have been a fun event but i think at this point it was becoming pretty clear that it was going to be tough when i used to fish competitive bass tournaments i used to do a little bit better in the tough tournaments when the bite's not as good one of my strengths is maintaining calm and focus when fishing when things aren't really going well i don't tend to let things spiral out of control. So here, I, it seems like we had a tough bite and maybe that would help level the playing field a little bit. And when you know, I was the first one to hook There we go. Up. And that is a bass. <laughs> nope. Gonna remain a bass fisherman at heart, I guess. Even though that bass doesn't count for the competition, what it did do was give me confidence that a fish in this lake will eat the flies I'm throwing. We still have to figure the trout out and figure out what their behavior is going to be and what working for them. But one thing it did give me confidence in was the, the leech I was throwing. I'm just going to keep throwing my midge tip here, fishing it through the water column. That bass ate on the bottom, so figured sticking to the bottom was still a pretty good idea. Here I'm just changing up some of my retrieve cadences. I'm trying some long poles here, see if that's something the trout would prefer. I'm still fishing deep because I haven't seen a ton of surface activity or seen any fish cruising up shallow. Here I'm trying to speed my cadence up a little bit. I can't go super fast because I still think deep's a ticket. So if we go super fast, the flies are going to rise up in the column. I'm still trying to give them a chance to stay near the bottom or at least in the bottom third of the water column. After about 10 minutes of no additional leaps though, I figure I'd try and throw something else just to see if I could find something else they'd prefer. Figured I'd throw the good old trusty jig sculpts all around, see if I can get some chasers or this would be another way to gauge their aggressiveness. They're willing to chase a streamer around. At this point, you should realize a lot of the commentary on this is going to be voiceover work because I didn't really want to talk to the camera when I was out there fishing and distract the other competitors who were trying to qualify for the team. I didn't want to you know, get in their way or anything, so you're going to have to deal with me talking after the fact. So I didn't get anything to chase a streamer, didn't get bumped, so I decided to go try 
Pushing a dry dropper. Here I'm just changing out my dropper fly on my rig. See if that will make a difference. I'm putting a cormorant on. There we go, that's a trout. Oh, was a trout. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dang it. So while I was disappointed with not getting that fish to the net, I did see that it was a trout. And I remembered what I was doing to get it to eat. I was letting the whole rig sink all the way down to near the bottom or on the bottom and the first little pull that I did is when it ate so from here going forward I'm going to always let the flies get settled back down and get vertical hanging from the floating line section and then just try and trigger a bite for, with that first pull after each time the rig settles down. There we go. Part of the process for recording your fish in this competition was taking a picture of it, so I'm doing that here.
for the first hour and the first beat, we we're able to get one trout to the net. You know, there weren't a lot of trout caught during this period. Wade caught most of them when he was standing next to me. So we weren't out of it by any means. I was encouraged that we were able to find a fly and a method that seemed like we could get them to eat. What was a little discouraging is that I felt this was probably the best quality of beat I was going to be on, and I had first crack at these fish, and to walk away with one seemed like maybe it was a little disappointing. But I was at least encouraged we had something to bring on to the next beat. So moving on to beat 6 and hour number 2, here's a little bit of a rundown of beat 6. On the right side there's a patch of reeds and in front of that was a flat about 5 to 8 feet deep. That was about where the boundary of the far end of the beat was. I did see a few rising fish out there earlier but they were I think they were outside the boundary of the beat and they were definitely outside of casting range. I just kept a dry dropper in mind if I ever saw some fish working out there. The left side of the beat had access to deeper water. The water wasn't quite as deep as the water I had been fishing on the previous hour, but it felt like it was my best chance to catch fish, so I was going to primarily focus on the left side of this beat. I did know one fish was caught here in the previous hour, so despite it not looking that great, uh, it gave me a little bit of confidence that maybe I'd be able to pull one or two out. My goal was to pull a single fish out of this beat. I thought that'd be... A pretty good result. So my plan starting out was to just work this full deeper left side with the midge tip. I've still got my balance leech and uh, TF chronomid on. Uh, the, I changed chronomids out during the break and I put my quill one on because I didn't get any hits on the gray boy version that I had on in the first hour. So I just thought the leech got hit, so let's switch out the dropper and see if we can... That change will encourage a fish to eat. No! Oh. Oh. It's frustrating. <laughs> So subtle. Well, let's talk a little bit about what we're doing here. The midge tip is a floating line with a three foot intermediate sinking section. What I'm letting the rig do essentially is to get sink all the way to the bottom so the whole sinking tip gets vertical. And then the floating line will support the rig a little bit so when you pull, it'll bring the flies up a little bit and then they'll drop back down. And I think that up and down motion is what was uh, encouraging the fish to eat. The takes are going to be super subtle, like I said. What I'm looking for in the line is for either the line to straighten out, the coils on the line to straighten out, or if I pull it, it doesn't and it doesn't coil back up and stay straight, that's going to be a fish. And that's what happened here.
that fish ate my TF Coronamid. That was a size 16 in the quill color. I was really glad I made the color change. I'm not sure I would have picked up the fish if I had stayed with the other color. But with the leech bouncing off the bottom, the Coronamid's just suspended. It's about four feet up the rig, but it's really only about two feet up in the water. So it's when you pull it, it looks like it's rising out of the weeds that are on the bottom. So that's how I think we triggered that fish. Ah, <sighs> wrong species. Yep. Ah. <sighs> It is no bass in my true calling. Did they catch a lot down there? What? Did they catch a lot down there? Another fish. Here on my wedge, you don't mind. <laughs> Found like a big three pound bass right there. Oh, wait, where am I? Am I in your beach? Oh, shoot, I'm in your beach. I haven't cast yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, why did this look really, I think, close to Bob? So, beat two was a lot like beat six, where the fish holding spot seemed like it was on the left side of the beat. There's kind of a deeper bowl straight out in front of me here that seemed like it was maybe two to three feet deeper than the right side of the beat to me it just seemed kind of like a fishier area than the right side so i was gonna just focus on fishing the midge tip through here again it wasn't the best holding water so i was trying to fish the best area in my confined little space another consideration was casting accessibility. As you can see on my left and right, there's some tall grass and some bushes. And this was pretty much the case in every single beat along the dam. So kind of planning out where your casting was going to go was pretty important. It seemed like there's some struggle among the competitors on getting casts caught up in this tall grass and it led to a lot of tangled rigs and just general frustration. So I was trying to make sure I had a clear casting path wherever I stood. I also wish I had a stripping basket. Because 
having the line hit the ground and potentially get caught in the grass and other sticky branches and stuff led to a little bit of frustration too. So I was kind of hoping I could stand in a place where I could let the line hit the ground and it wasn't going to get caught up in ruined casts and stuff. In the future, I'd bring a stripping basket with me for sure. So here's a case where you can see what I was looking for for strike detection. I'm going to slowly strip my rig in here and you're going to see that the coils don't show back up and that the rig goes tight. And that's when I realize there's a fish on. What? Yeah. So at this point I was sitting on three fish and I was two fish clear of the next person behind me and Glade I believe was on five so I felt like I was close and I had a real chance to maybe squeak out a tie for first for this uh, session. Here I switched to the dry fly because I saw a few risers and what I was trying to do during the hour was to rest the fish that were in my beat a little bit by switching up rigs. I didn't want to just throw the red and black leech for an hour straight. So I, when I saw rising fish, I wanted to pull the dry fly out to have a chance at getting a rising fish to eat and just rest my fish for 10 minutes. Unfortunately, Glade being the beast that he is, caught three more fish and put first place out of reach. But I was still happy to get the single fish that I did out of this beat because it was one of the tougher ones. What? Not sure. I'd say more likely bottom than grab. All right guys, so quick check-in after sector one. Uh, let's see, I caught three. I think, it's not official, but I think that was good for second in the group, which is cool. Uh, Glade smacked him and caught eight or nine. Fishing next, I was fishing next to him the whole time and just watched him catch fish. But you know, I guess we did pretty good on a tough lake. Anyways, uh, on to sector two. Session two, we we're gonna be on Meadow Lake. I drew beat one. This lake was a little bit different from Eagle in that it was both deeper 
and it had a little bit more beat variety and cover in the water. So beat one was actually a pretty interesting beat. It was one of the longest by width. I had about 15 yards to my left and 10 yards to my right. There was quite a lot of room. You can see there's this big weed bed to my left and it kind of there's kind of an edge the whole way along where you start to see the weeds disappear right there that led to kind of a deep bowl area all the way on the far left side of the beat the right side of the beat was just steep bank in front of me you could see a few cruising fish and this lake definitely had a lot bigger fish in it at least the ones we saw there the fish were big but I started off throwing this Mitch tip just to kind of get a feel for the beat and see if I could use it to kind of map what was going on in the deeper areas that I couldn't see past the weed beds in too. So I started off throwing the Mitch tip because that what worked at Eagle Lake, but I kind of quickly realized it's just going to be like jigging it through mid-column and that didn't really seem like the way to go. So I was going to try and target some of these fish that were cruising along this weed bed with a dry dropper setup. So I've got my Bob's Hopper and I'm dropping a TF Chronomid under it. Again, when we started fishing, catch rates weren't really that great. I know Glade caught a fish on the first cast, but it slowed down a little bit for everyone after that. Also during the break, I had changed out my chronomid that I was dropping off the hopper to the bloody stool version of my TF chronomid. Since I was going to be just fishing it barely over the tips of the weed beds, I wanted something that's more in the blood worm coloration realm. That. Yeah. I don't love that I have four X on.
Getting this fish to the net was super nice. It was a really nice bow. And since fishing seems slow again, I was glad to have the one fish I did. Here, I was pretty upset that I'm going to miss this dry fly take because I was messing with my line. Oh. Stupid. Dude, we need to hop it right now. So the dry dropper action kind of slowed down for me. I got a few fish to kind of swirl under the hopper a few times, but I couldn't induce a take and they weren't really interested in the chronomet drop below it. So I thought I'd try and sight fish some of these cruising fish with a uh, dreamer. So I was, I'm throwing my jig sculpt over here. Unfortunately, I had the sink tip line still on, so. I was getting the fish interested in chasing this, but the sink tip line was pulling the jig streamer towards me, and I wasn't able to work it how I wanted to, where I could kill it right in front of the fish and induce a take, because the whole time it was still moving towards me. If I could go back and do this again, I would really put it on the floating line on my five weight, and that would give me a lot more control over triggering a fish to eat it. I was getting a fish to eat nip at the tail here, but I feel like if I had a little more control over it, I would have gotten the full eat on it. So I spent the rest of my time kind of messing around with these fish that were chasing it. I just couldn't get them to eat the part and that would get a hook into them. It's kind of crazy how you draw on past experiences and apply them to different situations. So here I was thinking about cruising tiger trout along the shore in high you went to lakes and how you just spot them you know lazily cruising along shore and you drop a jig sculptzilla right in front of them and they'd eat it so i was just using my past experiences to try and recreate that here. So at the end of the first hour, I had one fish to the net and about kept pace with everybody else. Fishing at Metal Lake seemed just as tough as it was at Eagle Lake. Just one. Again, I didn't execute on my eats. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna pay for it if I don't get it together. How would the other guys do? I think Blade. What did Blade get? Three? I think Phil got one. And then he got one. So going into the second hour, I feel like catching that one fish out of beat number one kept me in it for the second session. Combined with the second place points from the first session, I was starting to feel like maybe I could make a run at this thing if I was able to pull a couple of fish out of the last two. But when I got to beat number three, all I saw was structureless, featureless, deep steep bank and I really didn't have a good game plan for how I was going to fish through here. I started off throwing a jig streamer just because I wanted to get something moderately deep down in the water column and see if I could get a few fish to chase just to see if they will. And I did get 
a couple of groups to follow it in, but they were not postured in a way where I thought they would ever eat it. So I quickly gave up on the idea of inducing a strike on the jig streamer. So I picked the midge tip up for a little bit, but I kind of felt the same as I did in the first beat, where it felt like I, just casting it out and letting it sink down to its maximum depth, I'd still just be fishing mid column, and if there are fish suspended out there, they were pretty unlikely to eat it as well, so. Well, I gave it a little bit of a try just because I didn't really have a great idea of what I wanted to do next. It didn't feel like it was ever going to be the right thing to do, either. It's kind of felt like I was fishing in the Dead Sea in this beat, honestly. And my confidence was starting to wane a little bit. I only saw, really, like one or two cruisers, and they were never really at all interested. Did see a couple rising fish, but again, that didn't really feel like a high percentage type of deal. But I was just kind of lost on what. So after the Mitch Tip stuff didn't work. I decided I was just going to throw a dry dropper and max out my legal leader length here and throw like a eight and a half foot dropper off my hopper. See if they could get them need a chronomid somewhere mid column if they're cruising around. I also changed out my coronamid here for one that was a little more heavily weighted so it would get to depth faster after each cast. And I think I put a bigger one on just so it would have a little bit bigger profile with the lower light down deeper. Casting this rig is really just not great and super awkward. So when I was talking about gear earlier, this is the part where I'm really happy I have my hardy ultralight to cast this rig. It did a great job at doing so. After getting absolutely no eats for about 45 minutes, it felt good to just see the hopper bounce under just a little bit. I didn't pin the fish, but it was good to know I was capable of getting an eat in this beat. This was a surprise.
bow, rainbow, yeah it's a nice one. Honestly, in super tough fishing conditions, I was super stoked to get a dry fly eat on my hopper, no less. But heading into the last beat, Blade was sitting on three fish, Mike had four, and I was tied for third with two, I believe. And I was headed to the beat where the most fish had been caught for our session. So I really, really went into this hour thinking I had a chance to take first for our group. I started out throwing dry dropper because that's what worked for me through the previous two beats and I figured I'd stick with it at least for a little bit to see if I could induce a need on top again or try and get one to eat the dropper. But nothing would hit my rig and I kind of gave up on it after about six or seven minutes. I then switched to my Mitch tip because this was finally the right type of water for it. It was shallow, there were weed beds, I could keep the leech and coronamid ticking over the tops of the weeds and hopefully induce uh, some takes from trout that are feeding over the weed beds. This was a beat that finally had some wind on it so I just had the slightest amount of chop and I really thought I was going to make something happen here. I got a short strike right away, but wasn't able to convert on it. I tried doing the slow retrieve that was working for me over at Eagle Lake, but didn't get any takes on it. You can see, uh, Muskrat or something swimming through the water right there. What I was able to find fishing through here was that they were reacting to a little bit faster paced retrieve. It seemed like I had to get a reaction strike versus getting a food eat. Honestly, not getting that fish to the net was pretty demoralizing as I was running out of time and I really, really, really needed that one. Looking back on this hour, I wish I had tried throwing the Jigsculpzilla on a floating line to try and get some of those reaction eats. I think it would have pinned the fish a little bit better and when getting those type of takes, it's generally a pretty good fly to use in this situation. But that's how our event ended for the Fly Fishing Team USA qualifier. Unfortunately for me, it ended with a whimper more than a bang. All in all, I still feel like I had a pretty good day. And in the end, I was proud of how I fished. So here's how the results ended up. 
For session one, we finished second, solo second, with three fish. For session two, we finished in a tie for third with two fish. Overall, I ended up in sixth place. Uh, I was tied with Spencer for placement points, but lost the tiebreaker on number of fish, so that bumped me down to sixth place. All in all, I was pretty happy with how I did. Again, my goal was to not get last, and I think we ended up doing very well. So to round out this video, I just wanted to give a couple of closing thoughts and give a couple of shout outs. I wanted to say thanks to Lance Egan and Glade Gunther for inviting me out to fill a spot in their mini qualifier. I had a ton of fun. All the competitors were awesome fishermen and really nice people too. I specifically want to shout out Mike, who was my session one controller. He's a cool guy, showed me the ropes. He watches the channel too, so thanks Mike. One thing that was also cool about this competition was every fish I caught were on my flies, which I thought was just an awesome thing. You know, I really do have confidence in some of the patterns I tie, and I'm glad they held up for me and performed for me under a competitive setting. So that was just a cool thing. I'm telling you guys, that leech is legit. You know, I don't really have any ambition to try and make Fly Fishing Team USA or qualify. I'm not sure if this will be my last competition or maybe if there's a chance in the future, but I'm not going to actively seek it out, I don't think. Despite that, it was a ton of fun to see how I could kind of hang with the rest of the competitive guys and felt like I was happy with how I performed. One of the things I really wanted to focus on was just efficiency whether it was casting or rig tying, I just wanted to make sure my flies were in the water as much as possible and not like be messing around with stuff or kind of getting flustered, changing rigs or just cycling through stuff. So I was really happy with how my casting held up and rig tying and all that stuff. So I was really glad that none of that really felt like it cost me too much time. Anyways, if you're interested in fishing a competition like this, you could always check the flycomps.com uh, fly fishing competition site. They have announcements and you could check if there's an upcoming event in your area and maybe you have the ambition to qualify for Fly Fishing Team USA. I gotta say the competitions were a great experience. I'd highly recommend doing them if it's something you're interested in. I'm sure you could go in and talk to Lance at Fly Fish Food about it if you want a little more info. Anyways, Thanks for watching the video. I had a fun a ton fishing the competition and shooting this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, if you'd like to purchase any flies that I used in the competition, there's a link down to my store in the description. If you enjoyed the video, as always, like it down below and consider subscribing. Thanks for all for watching.